Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I'm back uh, with the concluding parts of my long discussion of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Now, if you've been following the series, we are on chapter four, and in chapter four, Freire is explaining first the anti-dialogical modes of oppression, right? That we or he is trying to teach us how to undo, right? And he discusses it under four topics, right? And that is conquest, divide and rule, manipulation and cultural invasion. Now, I've already talked to you, discussed with you the first two, right? Conquest and divide and rule, and you can watch them. Today, I will talk about the third aspect of anti-dialogical forces or anti-dialogical action, and that is manipulation. You know, how do the dominant groups use manipulation and what purpose does it serve? So, as always, I'll first read from the text and then come back and talk to you about it. So, here we go with the first set of reading about manipulation. Manipulation is another dimension of the theory of anti-dialogical action, and like the strategy of division is an instrument of conquest, the objective around which all the dimensions of the theory revolve. By means of manipulation, the dominant elites try to conform the masses to their objectives. The greater the political immaturity of these people, rural or urban, the more easily the latter can be manipulated by those who do not wish to lose their power. The people are manipulated by the series of myths described earlier in this chapter, and by yet another myth, the model of itself which the bourgeois presents to the people as the possibility for their own ascent. In order for these myths to function, however, the people must accept the world of the bourgeois. Within certain historical conditions, manipulation is accomplished by means of pacts between the dominant and the dominated classes, pacts which, if considered superficially, might give the impression of a dialogue between the classes. In reality, however, these pacts are not dialogue because their true objectives are determined by the unequivocal interest of the dominant least. In the last analysis, pacts are used by the dominators to achieve their own ends. The support given by people to the so-called national bourgeois in defense of so-called national capitalism is, is an example in point. Sooner or later, these pacts always increase the subjugation of the people. They are proposed only when the people begin, even naively, to emerge from the historical process and by this emergence to threaten the dominant elites. The presence of the people in the historical process no longer as mere spectators, but with the first signs of aggressivity, is sufficiently disquieting to frighten the dominant elites into doubling the tactics of manipulation. This historical phase, manipul manipulation becomes a fundamental instrument for the preservation of domination. Prior to the emergence of the people, there is no manipulation, precisely speaking, but rather total suppression. When the oppressed are almost completely submerged in reality, it is unnecessary to manipulate them. In the anti-dialogical theory of action, manipulation is the response of the oppressor to the new concrete conditions of the historical process. Through manipulation, the dominant elites can lead the people into an unauthentic type of organization and can thus avoid the threatening alternative, the true organization of the emerged and emerging people. The latter have only two possibilities as, as they enter the historical process. Either they must organize authentically for their liberation or though they will be manipulated by the elites. Authentic organization is ob obviously not going to be submitted by the dominators. It is the task of the revolutionary leaders. 
It happens, however, that large sectors of oppressed form in urban proletariat, especially in the more industrialized centers of the country, although these sectors are occasionally restive, they lack revolutionary consciousness and consider themselves privileged. Manipulation, with its series of deceits and promises, usually finds fertile ground here. The antidote to manipulation lies in a critically conscious revolutionary organization which will pose to the people as problems their position in the historical process, the national reality and manipulation itself. Okay, so in the passages that I just read, and I'm going to break this section into two conversations. So the passages that I just read, there are a few things to keep in mind. There is a moment where Freire is suggesting that for powerful and for the elite to employ manipulation as a mode of control, people must have first emerged out of history as subjects of history. What he means by that and what I understand from it is that for as long as people are not united, are not organized, and they are silent participants in an oppressive order, then oppression works perfectly fine because you can keep people under control through oppression. But then oppression reaches a certain stage where people, you know, lift their heads organized, right, and emerge as participants in the historical process itself. That is when the elite forces must use manipulation. So it's kind of transition from oppressive state of practices from Althusser, right, to ideological state of practices. And that, he says, is done by actually, of course, first of all, keeping the people ill-informed, but also by giving them certain myths to rely on right? Like myths of upward mobility, that if you work hard enough, if you get an education, you could be part of the elite as well, like the idea of the American dream. Or the myths of a history or a preordained life, religion can play a huge role in that, right? But the reason the elite move on to manipulation and modes of manipulation is because one step has been taken by the people. They have emerged as realized human subjects of history. Right? They have become a constituency and that's crucial because that's when manipulation becomes a part. Now on page 148 there is a note right where Freire is distinguishing between two kinds of organization. So in this emergent state, people are organized, but it's not a critically sound organization. So he gives us the distinction. What is it? In the organization which results from acts of manipulation, the people, mere guided objects, are adapted to the objectives of the manipulators. In true organization, which we will read towards the end of this chapter, the individuals are active in the organizing process and the objectives of the organization are not imposed by others. In the first case, the organization is a means of massification. In the second, a means of liberation. And he further explains that. In Brazilian political terminology, Massification is the process of reducing the people to a manageable, unthinking agglomeration. So this was the note by the translator. So the passages that I read, what is becoming clear is that within the anti-dialogical way of looking at the world or dealing with people, manipulation becomes pertinent during a certain stage of mass mobilization. And that is when people have become slightly aware of what's happening to them and of their rights. So they need to be managed. 
how do we manage them, right? Nationalism, promises of upward mobility, promises of maintaining peace so that you could have your jobs. Right. So how many times has someone told you at your job, hey, we, we should consider ourselves lucky because we still have jobs. So we shouldn't cause a lot of problem. Staying to your own, not poking your nose into others affair. All of these things are there to keep us managed, right? to keep us under control. And then if you look at the modern world, if you look at the United States, I mean, uh, this is the manipulation it goes even way deeper than that, right? Um, the student educational system, it's so expensive that their education is connected to federal funds or other loans that they take. Those loans are always connected to good behavior. Right. So chances are you are not going to become part of a mass movement or protest because if you get a record, you can't access your loans. Like all of these things are there to manipulate us into the position that we are in to either keep us there or to tell us that the best way of surviving in this world is not to try to change the world, but to try to protect the little we have with the hope that we'll have more of it. Right. There, you can understand this actually more clearly if you read Althusser or just watch my conversation on his ideological state of practices. But there are some similarities here, right? Even though I don't think so, Freire was reading Althusser. I think Althusser comes after the book was published. Uh, I'm not sure. So manipulation then so far what we have understood is that it is a necessary stage for the oppressors when people have emerged as subjects in their own lives, they are not yet fully organized. So they are being managed by the elite through the myths, myths of loyalty, myths of the naturalized hierarchy, class structure, religion, right? The idea is to keep them from becoming organized in a way where they teach each other, they inform each other, and they become a larger constituency, right? So these are some of my thoughts on the chapter and especially on this aspect of manipulation uh, about the passages that we just read. So, so far we have covered fully um, conquest, divide and rule, and now I've covered the first section of the of the third strategy of oppression or anti-dialogical way of doing things, and that is manipulation. In the next conversation, I'll finish my discussion of manipulation, and then we will move on to divide and rule. Uh, I'm sorry, not divide and rule, cultural invasion. And that would give us a full discussion of the four things that Freire attributes with the anti-dialogical order. And then the book will end with four countermeasures that he proposes. So cooperation against conquest, unity of liberation through divide and rule, organization against manipulation, and cultural synthesis against cultural invasion. And we'll go into those in great detail. And then, you know, God willing, and if the creeks don't rise, I would have, with your help, concluded this probably one of the most important projects of my life. So that's it. Thank you so much. And let me know what you think. Let me know if I could do it better. Just suggest and comment. And then if you have a few moments, please subscribe to the channel, pass it on. You can also become members of the channel and support me in my efforts and, you know, whatever you feel like doing is enough for me. Thank you so much. I will now see you next time. Until then, as always, peace and love.